I'm the first lawyer in my family. Mm -hmm. um, like a lot of the people I went to law school with, and um, we're gonna be tasked with trying to deal with um, really scary issues in the 21st century, um, increasing climate change that is disproportionately affecting the Pacific, mm -hmm. um, growing economic inequality, these continuing traumas of the criminal justice system, the subject matter of my essay, which right. is uh, private prisons, which are ex actually expanding under the current presidential administration. Right. Uh, they're making more money than ever off of the backs of, you know, essentially brown bodies and kids, you know, um, and how our taxpayers, taxpayer dollars go to that. Like we are paying to house, um, predominantly Native Hawaiian men in um, in the Sonoran Desert. And I think it's inappropriate and unfair. And uh, the way that we get to more equitable solutions is by looking to um, community solutions. So like what actually works, so restorative justice practices. Mm -hmm. um, Kakahiaka Kako, good morning to my and still the waters rise listeners. I'm your host, Naya, and this is episode 31, entitled, How Do You Plea? With that said, I think from the excerpt that I pulled and, and started this show out with, you don't need to figure out what this conversation is going to be about. It's an important one, and I think it really bridges um, both what's important locally as well as what's important globally. So part of this conversation is definitely global in the sense that decolonizing the law, uh, creating equitable justice and restorative justice processes and systems the world over is important. This is a conversation that is being had in many different communities, but definitely needs to be amplified and supported. With that said, there's also the issue of the private prison, which is connected to this overarching issue, but it's happening here in Hawaii right now, and it's one that is very timely and important that we address immediately. So my guest is Sonny Ganadin. He is a lawyer, a journalist, and an artist. I'm really not gonna say too much more we kind of break it down in the show and as well. You can go to instillthewatersrise.com to get more information uh, and links to, you know, information about Sunny as well as this particular topic. In addition, I would say that Sonny himself would be like, seriously, uh, I'm really not all that important. Like, let's get on with it. Let's talk about the work that needs to be done. So I'm going to do that. With that said, there are a few things that I just want to say before we jump into the show. So first, I'm recording this on the morning of Halloween. And I just want to, Halloween 2018, and I want to underscore, I'm doing this on purpose because, you know, part of me is like, well, I'm going to wait a few days. You know, people have all kinds of other stuff that they're doing with friends and family. It's probably not the best time to launch the show. And then I was like, wait a minute, you know, you know, the historical roots of Halloween aside, which is a show in and of itself, the current contemporary, you know, Western manifestation of this particular holiday is very commercial and everybody dabbles in being, you know, dark and bad and the macabre. But the bottom line is the things that we really need to be afraid of are happening in broad daylight, right? They are not happening in the dark. They are not happening in costume. Uh, they're not happening with vampires and werewolves, etc. Uh, I'm thinking some of the things that are happening in this world on a daily basis uh, are far scarier than potential vampires and werewolves. So I actually want to underscore the fact of, of going live very intentionally uh, on, on Halloween. And I'm really asking all of you guys to really think about what is scary, what is dark, and to do that in the light of day on a daily basis and work to put an increasing percentage of your effort to change those things. Um, as well, I also want to say this is the very first show under my complete rebrand of Salted Logic. So just like you can find the, the blog post that goes along with this show online at instillthewatersrise.com, that will actually take you to saltedlogic.com and you can follow me across social media at saltedlogic. And that's good for Facebook, Instagram, 
and Twitter. So I, I finally feel a less schizophrenic and kind of like multiple personalities. You can find me everywhere under that same at Salted Logic. As well, I also wanted to say thank you, as always, to Native Books, Namea Hawaii, as well as Vai Vai, Kavai Vai Collective. If you are in Honolulu, you guys have probably heard about Vai Vai. You can go to their website, which is Vai Vai Collective, W A I W A I Collective. It's their first year anniversary coming up, and in terms of this topic and social justice, they are definitely a group that's looking to create, you know, an alternative economy, one that's invested in values and community uh, as well as it is interested in profits and uplifting people by uplifting their socioeconomic status. So Vivi has continued to let me record in their vault, truly the vault, since they were uh, they're at the location of a former bank. And they've really are a great hui or a great group of people to work with. And I look forward to, um, you know, I guess kind of living and recording in Vai Vai uh, for the foreseeable future. So thank you very much to them. So if you guys like the show, please, uh, you know, leave a review on iTunes, reach out to me. Maybe you guys can send me some uh, topic ideas. But I think at this point, we should really just jump into the conversation. So have a wonderful day, everyone. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Um, so, Mr. Donadin, thank you for joining me today. Oh yeah, mahalo. You? Thank you for um, bringing me on your show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Um, I'm just going to read the little short bio that um, came with the paper that you sent, and then you can let me know how like accurate, how, how much you like that one. So Sonny Gondadin is a lawyer, writer, artist, and teacher. In 2012, he was lead writer of the Native Hawaiian Justice Task Force, delivered to the legislature report. in 20... 20- oh. It's a report. It does. It says, it says Task Force Report. Dude, that's very good. Um, and actually, did you write this bio, or did the the... For I did it chapter. with other people. No, the report? Um, I can explain it. It was um, created as an act of legislature. Mm-hmm. I was the lead writer, so over 158, pe- 158 people testified, um, nine members of um, the legal community, including the judiciary, the prosecutors, the public defenders, um, members of the public uh, participated in it. I was the one that coalesced all that information into a narrative. Nice. Well, I think that that's going to feed, I think, definitely to obviously some of the background in terms of why we're talking about the topics that we are today and and your history and connection to them. Yeah. And so then in 2017, you were named Best Single Writer by the Hawaii Chapter Society of the Professional Journalists. Um, how do you feel about that award? I mean, is, is where does journalism fit for you in what you do? Um, I'm a writer, both by trade and I think by proclivity and by nature. <laughs> so it's just how I interact with the world, mm. with words. Um, yeah, I've always been a writer, so it was cool to be named best of something for once. <laughs> crazy, crazy, yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there's some there's some excellent writers in this community, so to be um, named among them is truly an honor. No, and that's just it. I one of the reasons that I called out to you too, just I really appreciate your writing. Oh, um, and then to learn that you're a lawyer and an artist, et cetera, it was really interesting. And then the last sentence here is he's an instructor in the ethnic studies department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He's a surfer and a paddler. So um, in that bio, would you say that encompasses who you are? Or is there like another sentence or two that you'd add to that? Something that's important to you? Uh, uh, I'm just like- <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just somebody that's had to pay the rent over the last bunch of years as an adult. So I, um, as a lawyer, I do criminal law and family law. Um, I'm a writer, so for various magazines, I've gotten to write um, everything about the Pacific, really. Mm-hmm. Um, artists and sports and um, communities, all kinds of stuff, you know. And so the, the surfing and paddling, since you actually, one of your comments was, you know, you're, you do want to get some work done, but you, you head out into the surf to kind of to decompress and connect. So is that, how much of that, that 
ocean life or that ocean component is not just a part of who you are, but fit, fits into like almost sustaining you? Is it one of those things for you? Oh, yeah. I'm like totally an <laughs> ocean person. I mean, so it's hard to um, quantify that or like put it or like put that in some sort of a box. It's just like part of the way I am. I'm probably going to go surf after this, you know? There I mean, you go. Um, enjoying the ocean and um, being like that since I was a kid. You know, my dad pushed me into my first few waves, like a lot of people. And, uh, yeah, it's like it, it, it guides where I wanted to live, uh, the kinds of communities I hang out with, mm. the people I want to date. Um, the, <laughs> you know, like, like, so it's, you know, I'm a beach person. Nice, nice. No, well, that's good. I mean, like I said, since it started out with, you know, lead writer for the Native Hawaiian Justice Task Force report, it's, I think it, it rounds that out to, to really end that with Surfer and Paddler, and that ultimately is really your motivating force for everything. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a big deal, man. Like, I go to work and I jump in the water, like nice. a lot of people. Yeah. Nice. And actually, that's a really good segue. So, um, so in the show, we are going to joke around a little bit, but I promised Sonny that I would be hard-hitting uh, for the topic that we are here to talk about today, which is, you know, decolonizing law and specifically there's an issue about private prison here. So we will get serious. I will let you like speak to that. But since we're talking about the ocean, I thought it was really interesting because in this particular chapter, and I'm going to read a little bit, it actually starts out with the ocean. And so it'll be interesting to kind of weave through this conversation, you know, how that keeps you on task uh, to tackle such, you know, challenging issues like this. So this is the excerpt. Everything looks different from the seat of canoe, from the vantage point outside Kewalo Basin. Honolulu looks like a far smaller town than it does from land. Fronting and the endless southern sea as the opposite vertices of the Polynesian Triangle are merely paddling distance over the horizon. This practice is typical for our canoe club Anuinui, named after the Hawaiian word for rainbow. A short run to the buoy outside the surf break at Bulls, and then a sprint to the buoy a kilometer off Leahi Diamond Head, where watermen like Duke Kahanamoku and Tom Blake tested their mettle and created a contemporary global culture of surf and outrigger culture nearly a century ago. Then circle the buoy and return to Kewalo. Kewalo. Honolulu traffic hums and pulses in the late afternoon. The waves for today's practice are coming in choruses too, and soon the workday is forgotten, overtaken by the focus of physicality and the ephemeral joy of the sunset sea. A few weeks earlier, a world away, I saw the proverbial end of the rainbow in the Sonoran Desert. I was driving to see a client at the Sabaro Correctional Center run by a corporation called Core Civic, a private prison an hour's drive southeast of Phoenix, Arizona. Saguaro presently holds nearly 2,000 of Hawaii's citizens, almost all men incarcerated in Saguaro are Hawaiian or Pacific Islanders, housed on lands once controlled by the Akimel Odam Nation, which is now the town of Elroy in Penal County, Arizona. Elroy, Eloy, excuse me, Eloy is known for its federal, state, and private prisons, as well as its chest-caving heat. The sunsets are also spectacular. So, it's interesting to me that, you know, and of course we're going to talk about the other components here, but for such a hard hitting topic like law and prisoners being moved away, starting it out from your vantage point of the ocean um, and this place where they've been taken to is completely separated from the ocean. So what, you know, for you, I just wanted to talk a little bit first about you know, your perspective and how you got to this place in your career where you're merging, like your relationship with ocean, with the work that you, that you do. I consider myself part of, um, I guess an emerging community of lawyers and, um, writers that are building on the work of the past few generations of, Pacific thinkers who are trying to decolonize um, various aspects of our being. So by that, I mean I'm trying to literally decolonize the law. Um, And I'm taking from that um, the experience that I have of um, being in the canoe, which is the um, prototypical um, Pacific metaphor of teamwork and peace and sportsmanship. 
and I'm intentionally using that um, as a legal metaphor. So mm-hmm. that's just the introduction. But from there, I go into um, some of the ways that um, private prisons operate, the ways that we historically got to this place, um, and then the ways that we can get out of it uh, using, um, I guess, uh, new law. Mm. Uh, so yeah, merging uh, literature and um, and my the, the way I act, like a lot of us actually live our lives uh, with a new way of um, thinking about um, the criminal justice system mm-hmm. and being um, and perpetuating the goals of having more peaceful and equitable society um, while holding people accountable for their crimes. Um, right. That's I think the only way to do it and. Uh, and um and it's supposed to be beautiful, it's a, it's supposed <laughs> to be lyric. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I grew up with people who laugh a lot and um and a, and a pretty kind family mm-hmm. and and I live in a nice place. I have the opportunity to um, go surf after this or um, lead the kind of life I want to. So that said, um, in my advocacy, I want to um, uh, reflect that lived experience. I, um, yeah. So that, that's why I expand on, um, on this topic. It's called the law of the canoe, mm-hmm. um, reckoning colonialism and criminal justice in the Pacific. It's going to be one of, um, I think over 20 chapters in a forthcoming book called decolonizing Hawaii, mm-hmm. um, edited by Hokulani Aikau and, uh, Bernadette Gonzalez. It's going to be published mm-hmm. by Duke university press in 2019. Um, I've been a writer for several years now for mm-hmm. magazines and the state and, um, and for other people. But I think um, I'm finally getting to the place after over 10 years of uh, legal practice and um, writing mm-hmm. and journalism and making art that I can uh, merge these ideas and these concepts into um, into something that works, you know. Well, I mean, and I guess I started out with that one to set the stage because I do think the way that you talk about it and just from some of our other mini conversations and and what I can glean, the way that you frame your life is much more of this this metaphor that's inter... It's not just law. I mean, you really look at, I guess, it's kind of like a multifaceted approach. And so to me, that's a big part of what interests me in what you're saying is your approach, right? It's not just fact. It's that you're making this choice to find equity, to find beauty. Um, and you, the way that you write about it in terms of other things that I've read that are about the law, um, I think it draws you in. So, Oh, right. thank you so much. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I'm not the first person to do this. So there's, um, I was... Uh, uh, educated to within an inch of my life at the William S. Richardson <laughs> School of Law. I, um, I've made many failures over the years. I've ditched uh, class for surfing. I'm hoping you did that at least. Yeah, but I mean, I, I also like <laughs> failed the bar and like and have messed up cases and mm. have messed up articles. And I mean, I'm just a person too. But there's um, a lot of smart folks uh, that came before me that have articulated critical theory and critical race theory. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's the notion that. Um, well, we have inequitable law mm-hmm. um, that um, is either the result of or causing um, inequalities in communities. And um, historically, uh, people of color, women, indigenous peoples weren't the creators of that law. I mean, if you just mm-hmm. look to the founding fathers, the original formation documents of not just the United States, but many Pacific Island nations, um, you know, it, it wasn't, um, I suppose, the broad concept of minorities that crafted these documents. And so how do we, mm. as um, people who um, don't have our heritage in the people that created these laws or find ourselves reflected in right. these laws, um, create them anew for the 21st century? So we're going to have to look... Um, to other sources. We're going to have to be broader. So we're going to have to um, look to our art, our communities, mm-hmm. our lived experience, um, the metaphors that guide um, those things mm-hmm. and expand those into what uh, lawyers call stare decisis, the, um, the historical case law. 
And when we do that, then we have an opportunity to, um, I guess, expand the law itself. So I, I intentionally talk about the canoe, and, I, and, I, and I'm trying to be um, as pretty as possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I think it's a, it's a valid legal metaphor, so um, it, um, it's, a, it's a metaphor for the 21st century, and not just in the past, you know? No, and that's, you know, even though I'm an artist as well, I'm not, you know, highlighting the beauty piece um, in, in some way to... Um, I don't know, like, you know, overtly bring uh, other sectors into the conversation about law, but I think that there is something about writing with beauty and the metaphor, though, that allows people to connect on a human level. And so I think there's a lot of what you're talking about that that kind of, in order for us to enact that kind of change, people have to want to care about what you're talking about. They want to either have to see themselves in it or see the future in terms of what you're talking about. So I think that creating that beauty or using those metaphors, um, you know, more so than just, I guess, being successful and, and, and uh, moving to, into the future, uh, I guess, maybe in a different way than we have in the past. You know, part of that is bringing the community along with you. And I think it takes speaking to them, you know, with a, a story versus just linear, factual Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and I, I, I'm the first lawyer in my family, mm-hmm. um, like a lot of the people I went to law school with, and um, we're going to be tasked with trying to deal with um, really scary issues in the 21st century, um, increasing climate change that is disproportionately affecting the Pacific, mm-hmm. um, growing economic inequality these continuing traumas of the criminal justice system, the subject matter of my essay, which is uh, private prisons, which are actually expanding under the current presidential administration. Uh, They're making more money than ever off of the backs of, you know, essentially brown bodies and kids, you know, Um, and how our taxpayers, taxpayer dollars go to that. Like we are paying to house, um, predominantly native Hawaiian men in, um, in the Sonoran desert. And I think it's inappropriate and unfair. And, uh, the way that we get to more equitable solutions is by looking to, um, community solutions. So like what actually works. So restorative justice practices, Mm -hmm. um, the, um, um, let's see, intentionally, uh, working through people's problems, having victim first models of, of justice, um, having real accountability for police officers and for prosecutors. Mm. Um, all this stuff is tough, but the way I want to get to it is through beauty. I don't want to get to it um, through the lens of a litigator because mm-hmm. I don't come from litigators. I come from um, people who like dance while they're cleaning the bathroom and like <laughs> and people who like go surf and. Um, and I live in the Pacific where you don't sing songs about, um, you know, like, like economic inequality. Like sometimes you do, but like, but you know, you sing songs about birds and mountains and the sea and, um, and that's culture. And, and so, um, so I'm intentionally imbuing my legal rhetoric and the way I think about the law and the way I think about creating a more equitable legal community with, with that, with, with the cultural place in the Pacific specifically. Nice. Well, and I think that that, you know, I think if you're going to serve a community, it it's servicing them through that lens and, and through, I guess, through the lens that they feel is theirs. And like you were saying, this, this is Hawaii. Well, that's, that's how you would want, you would want to do it, right? To, to pull the needs, uh, to, to fix the system and, and bring it through the culture that's rooted here. So I'm just going to read another little excerpt just to kind of infuse us both with the artistic side and then coming into some of some of the facts um, so that people just really know what we're talking about. So Hawaii is a troubled, overcrowded prison system, which includes four prisons and four jails on the islands and a private prison on the continent. The state of Hawaii has housed inmates in corporate prisons since 1994 when it entered into a contract with Corrections Corporation of America, CCA, which later rebranded itself as Core Civic. The CCA was allowed to choose who it housed from the state's male and female inmate populations, shuttling them across facilities in Alabama, Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida, Minnesota, Mississippi, Montana, and New Jersey. 
In 2008, the women who were sent to private prisons were brought home after lawsuits regarding sexual assault by guards. Most of the male pa'ahao were eventually, or prisoners, were eventually consolidated in Saguaro. Core Civic also operates numerous immigrant detention centers and has seen its stock ascend since the beginning of the Trump administration. So as we kind of turn from beauty, as we were talking about, to kind of the hardcore facts in terms of what's happening, um, yeah, this is what we're up against. St- yeah, yeah. Um, well, we can't f- like feel as if you know we're um, powerless mm-hmm. in the face of um, what some have called uh, neo-colonialism. What's really scary. Um, for me was the statistics mm. uh, which um, I wrote about um, regarding the representation of Pacific Islanders, specifically indigenous peoples mm-hmm. in criminal justice um, in the 21st century, how they almost mirror the statistics when we first started taking them at the turn of the century, when um, Hawaii still had the death penalty, when um, You know, when the United States was in the throes of Jim Crow, when um, um, other nations in uh, sub-Saharan Africa were still very much colonies. Uh, Mm -hmm. So this concept of decolonizing is not completely a metaphor. Like, we are still dealing with the issues of um, white supremacy in law and... um, and corporations making money off of the housing of bodies. Mm -hmm. And there's that really troubling um, historical context. That said, there's going to have to be a new way of thinking about this and maybe new people to be in the legislature to write Mm -hmm. new laws uh, which um, lead to fairness. Um, I'm working on a few things right now. So I'm working on bail reform here in Hawaii. Um, it turns out that about half of the people who are in um, incarcerated mm-hmm. in the state are that are pre-trial. That means they, they haven't been adjudicated guilty of anything. Uh, they're just too poor to get out. So they're not a danger to themselves or others. They just can't afford to leave. Right. So if they had uh, 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks, they'd be out. Um, so they're not really dangerous and they should be out um, taking care of their kids, going back to work, that mm-hmm. kind of a thing. Um, the modes by which the private prison industry is housing people and keeping them housed, um, probably unconstitutional. A lot of these things haven't been tested. We do know that they are not moral and they don't identify or they just don't jive with, Mm -hmm. um, the way most people see, um, criminal justice. So, um, and you have to think about the way trauma works. So um, people have asked me, you know, why are you talking about um, all these Hawaiian guys who are <laughs> stuck in jail and, the, and, and like who kill somebody or rape people or um, really hurt our society? And we know now that trauma is circular, that um, mm-hmm. hurt begets hurt in terrifying and intergenerational and sure. predictable ways. Yeah. What um, some people call epigenesis, the ways that um, I guess it that stuff is even carried on in your DNA, which scares the shit out of me. Sorry. Um, but (laughs) yeah. Um, but that said, um, you know, we got to help kids. We have Mm -hmm. to, um, like model better behavior for adults. Uh, We need to stop spending so much money on, um, housing these folks. And, uh, yeah. And, And we need to make a, a fair system for the 21st century. So even though we're talking about this, you know, issue in Hawaii, it's clear it's an issue that's not just here in Hawaii. Oh, so, no. Right. Oh, no. So, like, so Native peoples are over-incarcerated and die at higher rates throughout the world and in the Pacific. So it's like this. And what's re- messed up is the, the statistics are, like, almost mirror what's happening in New Zealand, um, in Canada, mm-hmm. in Alaska, in places like North Dakota, where there's significant native communities. What does that say about our history of colonialism and neocolonialism? Who wrote the law? Who's changing the law? Mm-hmm. All that stuff. You know, it's a. Um, and I'm not. I'm a. I'm a lawyer. I'm and a writer. I'm not allowed to um, step away from the system and um, mock it. Mm. I can't be a troll. 
Um, I am deeply invested in power, the way it perpetuates itself, the way laws are written. That's my profession. So that said, I'm looking for the ways to change the law to um, modify power in the future. So before we get into some of the things that you'd like to see here, since this is you know, really a, a global issue, how do you see what you want to do here in Hawaii being connected to those movements? And is there a larger conversation? Like, is there some larger strategy where, like, does progress need to break, in essence, somewhere else to give more validity to the work you're doing here? Like, are, are, and are some of these movements, because like you said, you're, you're not the only one, are they, are they being leveraged? Are, like, are you talking to other people so that you guys can bring together some of your efforts where people are trying to make change in other places on this? Issue? Oh, I'm doing my best, but so many of us are doing this like essentially pro bono for free, right? <laughs> so it's like I didn't get paid anything to write this essay. Right. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm not getting paid to be here today. I am doing this because I think it's the right thing to do with my life. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, of course I'm trying to communicate to um some very bright attorneys, judges, people in New Zealand. Um, I read everything I can that's mm-hmm. happening in native communities in Canada because I think this is where the cutting edge is. What's unfortunate about American law is that it is so insular. Our stare decisis is based essentially on the American Constitution and then mm-hmm. everything and then everything that came before it. Hawaii is a little different because there was a sovereign kingdom, so we can look to um, the laws that were prior to 1898, mm-hmm. which actually has happened several times here in the history of Hawaii. Uh, when we look at environmental protection, that is also part of mm-hmm. what I consider the law of the canoe. Um, and so we have this special kind of relationship to the land and to native peoples mm-hmm. and native law um, that I think really we need to respect moving forward. Um, yeah, but it, it's, it's hard. The as a lawyer doing this kind of work, the um, the artistic community is much more progressive in terms of mm-hmm. looking outward, as is the um, community of um, writers, people who do literature, um, educators. They're they're much better at that. The way um, law is taught and structured in mm-hmm. the United States um, and in the states like Hawaii is uh, is fairly insular. So and. Uh you know, maybe a dumb question, but so if as progress or let, let's say that um, there was some movement in a global sense or in an international sense, would those kinds of things have a direct impact here in Hawaii? Does it like when you're saying that uh, U.S. law is kind of insular, does there does there need to be some breakthroughs almost domestically for some movement to really happen? Or if there were like a breakthrough or progress or some other um, I guess, significant positive achievement on this front. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. what we're hoping with bail reform. So California has had all the reports and then some that Hawaii has. And then their legislature, instead of um, doing the conservative approach, essentially ended bail in all of California. I mean, they've got a massive population, the sixth mm. largest economy in the world. And um, now if you get charged with a crime there, you pretty much have a safety assessment. You're run through the program. They figure out if you're a danger to yourself or somebody else, mm-hmm. if you're going to um, go back and hurt somebody, or if you're going to be a flight risk and leave uh, before your trial date. And then you're back out there. You got to you know, you know, gotta keep contributing, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, we don't do that here in Hawaii. And I'm hoping that we do. New York, New Jersey, Texas is already doing this kind of thing. Texas has ended its relationships with private prisons. Mm-hmm mainly because of the money. So legislators are looking at where the cash is going. Um, Mm. So this criminal justice reform thing that's happening in the United States, it's a weird confluence of social justice advocates and uh, fiscally conservative Republicans. Huh. It's funky, huh? (laughs) Yeah. So Can I just sit with that? (laughs) That's interesting. That's... Yeah, and so um, for me... Knowing that, Mm -hmm. um, how do I move forward as an advocate? Um, I want to do it um, with some style. (laughs) And and continuing to refer to the Mm -hmm. original documents of Hawaii and to the things that make this place special. Because if we're going to change, I don't want us to model Texas. I don't want us to model New Jersey. I want us to be um, uniquely Hawaii. And I think that the um, law enforcement community, the people who do 
who advocate for victims, who advocate for victims of domestic violence, like mm-hmm. myself, um, right. we deserve that. We deserve um, laws that that reflect the uniqueness of this place. No, I mean that, that's ultimately, I think, you know, what every community uh, deserves. Yeah. So, so we can talk specifically about the the private prison issue, but you know, first. Uh, one of the lines that you have here is that, you know, nothing will change unless our most deeply held concepts of justice are reformed. And, you know, what, what do you think that is? And do you mean that on maybe like a community scale or even like as, as individual citizens? Or is it the legal system itself, both? I mean, what, what are those, uh, right there, like, what are those deeply held beliefs and is it a matter of changing like lawyers, judges, et cetera, or is it about, you know, even changing the larger social construct of what, you know, your normal, like everyday person on the sidewalk thinks is justice. (laughs) What I'm trying to do with this essay Mm -hmm. and with a lot of my work is talk to both, um, I guess, regular folks who don't Mm -hmm. know anything about the law and then straight up lawyers and legislators Mm -hmm. and letting them know that, you know, this, the way we've been doing this for the last 200 years is like, um, really inequitable. We need a new way here. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think that that new way is an old way. So I'm not, I'm not saying anything too dissimilar from the folks that you talk to that are, um, farmers or, or who do fish pond stuff Mm -hmm. or, um, or who do literature, mm-hmm. what I'm doing is taking those ideas and then moving them into law. So, um, you know, mass incarceration from the perspective of people of color and indigenous peoples is and has been used as a tool of oppression. So how do we respond to that? We respond to that by looking towards native communities and the ways that they are solving this problem on their own. Um, so I really like restorative justice practices, mm-hmm. Um, which are victim-centered, um, community-based. By that, I mean, um, if it's possible, trying to um, give an offender the tools mm. uh, she or he needs uh, to um, return back to society, trying to, they're trying your best to make the victim whole again. Um, I'm not speaking just about violent crime, but mm-hmm. by, like, um, other kinds of things, you know? So, so, like, so like, so really thinking out the way trauma works and, um, and trying to, um, break those cycles at, at every, at every way. So it almost feels like, I guess, from a, that medical standpoint where you can be a doctor, but it, there, it's like your bedside manner, that social component, that interaction with the, the human side, um, also has to get taught. I mean, that doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be for you to be a doctor, but you want Hopefully, as a holistically, right, as someone who's a practitioner, yeah, and we, we, and we want to do that. And there. we know so how, we, and we know how um, economic and social inequality in the community leads to negative health outcomes for um, specific communities, especially with native communities. You know, right? So um, that's not an inappropriate metaphor. But what we've found, um, by we, I mean all the folks that do this work, is that these restorative justice practices work. So, um, job placement centers, uh, community programming, um, trying to get kids back into education programs, uh, kids who mess up, trying to get them, um, you know, like some sort of like meaningful cultural work, that kind of stuff. Everything works. You know what doesn't work? Throwing somebody (laughs) into a damn cell in the middle of the desert and throwing away the key without programs and then, um, you know, these wildly punitive measures. It only works if you're a private prison industry and you want to make a buck. Right. So it so, works for them. Right. So, so yeah, so we, I will definitely jump there, but for, so in terms of like that medical metaphor, is there something, you know, cause it, it's a wider web. And so yes, you have issues that, um, you could point to, to fix, but if we kind of back engineer and go where to the source, it's not just litigators, right? It's, like, are there, is there a movement even within um, law school and other things to begin to change how lawyers think? You know, because lawyers eventually move forward, become judges. I mean, is there a larger movement 
not simply to be able to point to like, you know, if, if we institute oh, yeah. community so, programs, um, this works, but like how are people being trained? So oh yeah. That you're so not I'm, the, I'm a proud I mean? graduate of the William S. Richardson School of Law, named mm-hmm. after the first uh, Native Hawaiian chief justice since the overthrow. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was educated in critical race theory by some brilliant minds uh, at the law school, which tries to imbue the law with personal histories, with mm-hmm. um, real discussions of power in the community, instead of uh, talking about the laws if it's in some sort of a specific bubble, you know, like, um, like you know, that a contract just occurs mm-hmm. in a vacuum. That's not how actual transactions work. Um, or talking about, you know, the... Um, somebody taking a guilty plea is if that happens in an in a vacuum as well. It's like, mm-hmm. like there's a whole bunch of things that, that lead to that. Um, I, I do want to say that um, my advocacy for a more equitable criminal justice system mm-hmm. is not to say that uh, people don't uh, need to be held accountable for their crimes yeah. or that um, public safety is not paramount, that we all deserve to um, enjoy the beauty of this place mm-hmm. and our personal freedoms without the worry of criminal behavior. Mm-hmm. So, um, that said, the way that we punish people, the way that um, corporations make money off the backs of human beings, um, and the ways that uh, people are made whole again is totally incompatible with the um, ideals of this community and the way that I think most of us um, think is really fair. Yeah, I mean, you get no argument for me <laughs> on that one. You want to no sell, not a hard sell. Yeah. So, Specifically, though, to the private prison. Yeah. Um, since that's you know it's that's not uh, ambiguous, unknown thing like a, that would be a solid building with walls and and literally built. So what? How do you? What would you like to say in terms of that specific issue, like bringing that here or stopping it or what? Okay, so there's a. Um, a bill that has been passed through the legislature, which will replace the, earn, the current OCCC that's in Kalihi. Mm-hmm. That's 16 acres, kind of right in the heart of the city. Right. And um, and we could move it to Halava with what they call a public-private partnership. Problem is, jails don't operate the way, say, jeez, um, uh, uh, you know, like a shopping mall might or something. <laughs> like, like we're housing right. bodies here, right? Right. right. So th- this is not the way to do it. Um, and in a society, certain people, a certain percentage of the community um, end up becoming criminals. And mm-hmm. so that's why you have jails. And so a society has a school, it has a firehouse, it has a prison. Right. And um, and that's where our taxpayer dollars should go. This could cost us $600 million, uh, so a little bit over half a billion dollars. Uh, Hawaii is very good, and the legislature is very good at um, cutting checks it doesn't have. Mm-hmm. So if we look at rail, super ferry, TMT, all these things, they're, they're kind of um, uh, historical reference points which um, note how politicians have just sort of um, given free reign to local industry Mm -hmm. and at the expense of the taxpayer and at the expense of um, future generations so or H3 so there's a there's a lot of like Hawaii has a real history of this and um, and what I want to say is that um, there's too much at stake to make that kind of a mistake with a mega jail here on Oahu. There's too much information that has been provided to people in power mm. that know that this is functionally inequitable, that it actually doesn't make our community any safer. And so we should slow this whole process down, uh, think out the kind of um, prison that we do want, one that actually makes people better, makes our community safer, right. um, saves us some money, and uh, and head in that direction. I'm not alone. There's lots of judges and lawyers and community advocates that think this. Um, now it's time to convince the governor and the legislature that, that we're on the right track. No, I mean, I think that that's, you know, when I originally asked you, like, to for people to really shift their thoughts of, of what justice is, and is that those people within the system? Is it the general public? Like, do you feel, what's the component of having a greater awareness of 
I guess, the inequity of the legal system or in this issue specifically, like about like the data the, that shows the private prison wouldn't be great. Is it like, do we need more public support or is this something currently? Oh, absolutely. You know, you know? We need more public support. And mm-hmm. that's part of the reason that I'm talking to you today. So um, I'm hoping that um, Hawaiians specifically see this as a Hawaiian issue that just like the um, development on the Mauna, which mm. kind of undercut the um, processes which should have happened to make sure that the public got input, that's happening with a mega prison here on Oahu. And the stakes are high. Um, it will mean that for the next few generations, there's going to be an overrepresentation of Native Hawaiians in criminal justice like there has been for the last 200 years. It's not fair. It's time to slow this thing down, think out the process mm-hmm. that we want and, um, and the laws that we want. We could pass bail reform this year. We could start to articulate a criminal justice system and a process of rehabilitation for most mm. inmates mm-hmm. that makes them functioning members of society. The guys that are in there, most of them are dads. And it would be really cool if they got back right. out in the workforce. Right. Um, we, we need to, to work on this. Um, as somebody who's not Hawaiian, mm-hmm. uh, who, um, you know, my dad's a Filipino guy. I grew up on Guam. <laughs> my, mom, you know, my mom's like Latino. She's like lighter than you, right? Like I, I, um, I consider myself the son of um, people who came to the United States and came to Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And, um, and as a community as, and as a part of a community of progressive attorneys who are really trying to work on this system. Um, but... I'm hoping that Native people see this as a Native issue moving in, into the next few years. Um, I, I think there's real political power there. I know there's political power there. Um, and, uh, and, and, um, and it's inclusive. Um, there, there's a reason that I invoke the canoe. There's a, the, uh, there's a reason that I yeah. invoke um, the beauty of this place, like the way a singer would or somebody who writes a, about this place as a poet would. Um, I'm, I'm using the form and the format of native literature and native song to tell you that there's real inequality here. I'm doing my best. No, and that, that, I guess that for me, I didn't really think of framing it in terms of like an Oli or even a chant, the same kind of thing of protocol where you come in and you set the stage. I mean, that's what it felt like in reading the chapter to start out with that perspective of being in the Ba and looking back that, um, at least anyway, that's like I said, I didn't maybe articulate that, articulate it that way in my mind until you're saying that now. Um, but I do think that you set, uh, you know, a powerful stage to talk about this. So, I mean, what, I mean, what can people do? Is it simple as like, knowing this particular issue and is it this issue is it calling your legislator is it voting different is it like what what is that average joe absolutely we've got an election coming up i don't know if this is gonna be um um, put online or anything prior to that but um you can absolutely vote your um vote this discussion in Mm -hmm. um the governor wants to uh, fast track this development of the private prison. Uh, governor Ige is probably going to be um, um, serving a second term. So I think that he should be made aware that this is an important issue to the community. Mm-hmm. Your local legislator has a lot of power in um, figuring out uh, in determining whether or not the state's going to have bail reform in the next few years. Mm-hmm. This is a multi-million dollar discussion. It is as important as funding schools, as fixing roads. Um, this is a big deal. Um, there's the possibility of a constitutional convention. Um, so, um, I think the pros of that are, uh, um, bringing things like, uh, environmental protection and, um, and, um, and how much we pay for like the DOE and criminal justice reform, Mm -hmm. um, to voters, uh, the cons are the possibility of, uh, outside influence. Um, yeah. I'm kind of uh, neither here nor there about it, um, but <laughs> um, what I'm hoping is that as people are made more aware of it, uh, they say, no, we don't need a $600 million jail that mm-hmm. just houses 
primarily native peoples um, that continually traumatizes human beings, makes them worse off, um, and that we need a better system. There's a lot of folks that um, brighter than me who have um, designed um, better versions of jails that have um, um, instituted uh, restorative justice practices into, into institutions. Um, yeah, like, like that's the direction that we should be headed. And it's absolutely a native issue. It's, oh, I mean, it's, absolutely, yes. it's, it's, as, it's as native an issue, I think, as art itself and it in its broadest category i mean like the the dance the song the literature the like what we're talking about is people's bodies here i mean there's i mean i I've, I've had it's like the commodification of indigenous bodies i I've, I've had cousins in prison and like and i'm a lawyer and um i don't know anybody who's hawaiian like um who doesn't like know a relative or somebody who's mm-hmm. been deeply um, entrenched in the criminal justice system. So we got to move towards a more equitable system in the 21st century. We just have to. No. And, that, and for me, I, you know, I'm hoping people that really see this, um, you know, kind of like that layered onion, like, yes, the private prison is a specific, like discreet, uh, argument or challenge that we could take on. But the larger conversation is this decolonization of the law and really switching to a more equitable system, which is also which I guess houses or encompasses this private prison issue, but it's broader in the sense of how the law is. Yeah, the, yeah, like who yeah. wrote the law, how it's structured, right. like how it. I mean, so yeah, so we have multiple things going on. So yes, like it's like come forward now immediately for this issue, but for me, right there, it's a larger awareness of how to get engaged for the long term. There's other things that have to be changed versus just stopping the private prison. Oh yeah, this is. A lifetime thing for me, though. Mm-hmm. So it's like I'm an advocate for um, an equitable justice system. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good way to spend my career. Um, and I thank my parents for not like totally traumatizing me. So it's like, <laughs> so it's like I can still, you know, I can still practice law and get uh, beat up in a courtroom or talk about these traumatizing things mm-hmm. and still be a generally happy person. Um, but I'm not expecting average people to um, dedicate their lives to. Um, what I've dedicated my life to, which is criminal justice reform. Mm-hmm. But what, what I am hoping is that the community starts to show up in, in the next few years because we need, we need folks to be not just educated about this, but like show up to testify, mm-hmm. to march if it, if it requires us marching, to, um, to run for office if that's what it takes, to take your seat in a canoe or a government or a classroom mm-hmm. or a boardroom, and to say that criminal justice reform and justice reform generally is um, what we got to do. Um, I am trying to take the influences that are um, um, I'm taking in every day from literature and art and mm-hmm. imbue the, that into the advocacy that I do. So Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't, again, I don't think it's a hard sell. It's not a hard sell for me. And I don't think for the Native Hawaiian community, um, to to take this on. Again, they may not choose to become a litig- litigator or commit to this in the way that you have with that said in order for, you know, most, at least most of the Hawaiians I hang out with in our community, it it is a conversation of how do we heal Lahui? How do we, you know, uplift Lahui? And to me, this is a component, you know, even though I haven't delved deeply into um, this particular vein that, that you're in, I mean, it, it's not rocket science. It's like, if this isn't addressed, though, this has wider, this has links to other wider social issues. It's so, yeah. to me, it, um, it, it would be something to march for, right? It would yeah, be something I mean, to stand up for. I've marched for it. So it's like, right. I mean, so the folks that marched against the 30 meter telescope mm-hmm. on Mount Okea, it's like, you don't expect all of them to read the environmental impact statement, <laughs> the uh, multiple motions filed before the intermediate court of appeals to uh, read the statements made by the landowner mm-hmm. and the state since 1987. No, it's like, this is freaking wrong. And so we're going to stand for something mm-hmm. and we're going to do it using culture. And 
it would be gorgeous if that started to happen around criminal justice reform. Like it has happened really. In no, and I, and, I, and that is a very like on a daily basis direct impact. Very often for a lot of for a lot of people. I mean, it would make a it would make that kind of change. Uh, I think in terms of of how people saw their daily lives or especially within families who've been directly impacted. Yeah. And I mean, it's like so many of the people that who have family members that, um, have been incarcerated or, um, have been arguably unjustly treated by the criminal justice system. They're also victims. Mm -hmm. So it's like, these are also the family members of victims or they are victims themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're touching on really heady subjects that are like deeply personal for, um, a lot of folks in the community. Mm -hmm. Um, and then judges and lawyers, we don't like to be told that we're unfair, you know, or (laughs) that, or that we are part of a system that grinds human beings up and spits them out. You know, like we, we want to, most of us come into the profession, um, with a fundamental belief in the, in equal opportunity and Mm -hmm. the equal application of the law. Um, I certainly do all the judges that I clerked for do, Mm um, you know, the, it's an honorable profession if you do it right. And, uh, but that said, um, we just can't build a damn mega jail to, uh, house native people. That's just not the way to do it. Right. And, uh, and there are bigger forces involved here. Um, the capitalist, uh, criminal justice system, you know, they, they make money on you coming and going. So the private prison industry charges people to make phone calls, to accept phone calls, to, um, go to the commissary to um, um, all these like added up charges mm-hmm. that are involved with criminal justice, you know, and all this stuff kind of happened like, and just got tacked on since the seventies really. But before that it was like straight death. Right. So it's like, right. So the, you know, we had the death penalty until 1948, just prior to statehood. Mm-hmm. Um, and then other states, they still have the death penalty. And you look at the statistics who, who get killed by states and then, right. you know, the ways that some of them are, um, have mental illnesses or the ways that, um, some of the Southern states still, um, have it on the books where you can, the state can, um, kill a minor essentially, you know, this mm-hmm. is heavy stuff, right? Yeah. So, um, but that said, uh, like w- let's articulate what we want. So instead of just raging against the machine, like let's actually like define what what we want, like the future that we want. So I love that band, by the way. Um, but so right here, then what? So let's erase the mega jail. Um, yeah. And what is your personal vision for what could be? Okay, so we're gonna have to replace the current O Triple C because uh, it was never really. Um, <laughs> like built properly since yeah, you know, and then and then you know it's and then there's uh, real issues with the guards and safety. Um, mm-hmm. There've been multiple deaths there. Um, we're gonna have to work on all of the prisons. Um, I think that there's excellent models happening throughout the state mm-hmm. actually. So um, the juvenile justice system did has done excellent work in the last five or six years. So they are moving towards um, reform for many of the kids that come in and out mm-hmm. of there. They are trying to incarcerate girls as little as possible because many times it's um, like females who Mm -hmm. entered the criminal justice system. Um, They are the victims of trauma, assault, sex assault, trafficking. um, And they're only there because of like the, like the fools and the guys that got there. Right. So, um, so we have models within the state. Mm -hmm. So, um, so moving towards a more restorative justice practice, the mm-hmm. way the juvenile justice system has and the way those judges have already done it yeah. and those guards have already done it, that's a good model. Um, looking towards other native communities is a way to do it. So um, if it's safe for victims, then you try to initiate restorative justice practices. Mm-hmm. Ending the contract with private prisons, just saying, screw you, like we're done. Right. Um, there's no detente with them. There is no meeting <laughs> yeah. in the middle with these folks. <laughs> right. it, it's just, no, like, screw you, we're done. Like, end contracting where people can make money off of the sale and transfer mm-hmm. of human bodies. So there's that. And, um, and really thinking out what that new facility is going to look like. 
So that means being more inclusive with the community. There's mm-hmm. an entire task force that is coming up with recommendations in just a couple mm-hmm. months. Okay. So we should uh, take those uh, task force recommendations seriously and then develop a facility based off of that. Um, it'll save us a lot of money. We got to do bail reform. Um, and then that this is just one component of healing the mm. intergenerational trauma mm-hmm. of, you know, the um, taking of land and bodies by colonial powers in the Pacific, right? So we are talking not just about fixing criminal justice system, but like fixing the messed up historical um, trauma that happened with the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom mm-hmm. with... Um, the imposition of justice systems brought here from the United States during the Jim Crow era. Mm-hmm. Um, we are talking about trying to identify with our Pacific brothers and sisters in developing a more equitable system. So, um, yeah. So, <laughs> so th- I know that's a, that's a lot to take, but for the next uh, year or so, we need bail reform. We need the uh, governor and our legislature to know that um, we shouldn't be building a private mega prison here um, in Halava. That's not cool. No, and I, you know, like like anything though, I think with any community, indigenous or otherwise, that is moving to heal long term trauma, it's always a process of you know the I guess the healing and progress of the individual and then the collective, and those often move on different scales. And then I also think the journey is one where you, I guess, attack, right? You need to attack or address hot topic, like in the moment issues like the prison, and then pull back and actually see, right, all the work that still continually needs to get done. And so, so I mean, I think we're in essence, we're, uh, the Hawaiian community is used to doing that. It's just, um, uh, I'm interested to see in the future where, just because, you know, me, myself personally, I know people in, in healthcare, in law, and other things, and to see those efforts, I guess, maybe dovetail more um, intentionally, like you're saying, so that you have community programs and lawyers and all these other components, I think, that are, that are happening um, on their own, I guess, to be brought together to, like, speak to how you would design yeah, the only the Yeah, only would. the state can do that. Mm. Um, so that's why I'm deeply involved with changing law. So it's like you can't expect um, private individuals to take on the very difficult work of healing communities all the Mm -hmm. time, right? Like we're doing this for free. We've got to like – this is one of the hardest places in the developed world to be able to pay the rent, take care of your kids, travel, do anything like that, live a life that Mm -hmm. is worth living. So um, that's why I'm deeply involved in changing the law and and talking about what the state does. So so the state needs to be involved in that. Nice. Um, to doing, you know, like, like doing um, best practices, uh, trying to not like um, re-traumatize human beings. We have a mixed history, a mixed bag of doing that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So can we touch a little bit on, since we are talking about a um, lot, but your, your recent run uh, for political office. Oh, yeah, run for office. Yes. Yeah. So speak a little bit to you. I mean, just why you, I mean, do you see yourself long-term uh, moving more into politics out of law or combining you know those two the, um, the way that you want to help community I guess. This discussion brought me to politics so I think mm. only weirdos and bullies think about <laughs> being politicians when they're kids right? Like, like I don't want to be! No, 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 uh, not at all but you know a lot of the over the years of being an advocate and a lawyer and making art and talking to folks. I, I've met a lot of politicians and they have, they're for the most part, well-meaning people um, with shortcomings similar to my own. And, uh, and a lot of them are just straight up lazy. And I thought, you know, I can pull this <laughs> off. And so I hit the street with my dad and my tita uh-huh. who, and who speak Tagalog and Ilocano. And um, I've been living in Kalihi for a few years. And so I ran for office. Um, and I'm very proud to have received the endorsement. Uh, our campaign received the endorsement of, most every major labor union in mm-hmm. in the state, the teachers, uh, the newspaper, um, a lot of my peers—they're the ones that paid for this mm. um, to get those mailers out. 
cost a lot of money to run for office, and um, and we won just by a few votes. I mean, we we didn't win; we <laughs> lost by a few votes. People were telling us we won, um, and then uh, yeah, under uh, some kind of questionable circumstances. So we'll see. Well, yeah, no, and so in you know in in the blog post that I always put up alongside this, I'll have some links so that you guys can go check out uh, Sunny's page. But what I appreciated. Uh, in your campaign, uh, I guess in this era, right, of social media was a lot of the, not just walking around in community, but like direct in community. Like I remember one picture, it looked like, I don't know if it was like the storm or something was coming and you were helping people like do sandbags and, um, you know, this, it's definitely, you weren't just like picking up kids and like, you know, you <laughs> oh, were kid. just kissing babies. Well, it's like <laughs> a lot of the job is kissing babies and shaking hands. But I mean, um, I, I do public service. I'm a sometimes humble, not so humble public servant. And, um, <laughs> and this is what I do. And it's like, and there was a, an apartment off of Umi street that had flooded just a few years ago because city and county never got around to clearing Kalihi stream. And, uh, and here comes a hurricane and I knew that it was going to go down. Um, I had a few hundred bucks and a friend of mine helped to put together some sandbags and we tried to make sure that people didn't get flooded out of their apartment. Yeah. I mean, that's, but that's, like I said, I mean, that's on, that's kind of like on the ground, um, working. T- and I guess for me, right. You're doing the good work, whether you get oh, elected thanks. or not. Well, that, so. that, ain't way, that ain't the way I want to do it. I, I mean, like what I want to do <laughs> right. is get the state to pay so that the place doesn't flood. So that right. people like, um, have the resources they need to deal with, um, economic inequality and, uh, climate change. You know, we're getting nailed by mm-hmm. stronger and more, persistent storms every year and um and so like we like our local communities need to react to that in Kalihi there's um a lot of folks that are constantly dealing with flooding unsafe conditions lead in the ground there's I mean there's issues around both Kalihi stream and Halava stream not being dredged and it's not as if these aren't um these are like you know like wonderful like gorgeous Lo'i with integrated mm-hmm. like environmental right. systems. Like we're, t- we're talking about urban Honolulu here, right? right. So it's like yeah. the, these places were like dredged over 150 years ago. And so, and these are people and people's lives. And so only the state can do this kind of work. Only the state can build a prison. Only the state can um, do major water management and control mm-hmm. and do it in a way that's equitable and fair for the people that actually work in this city. And and mm. like you're just trying to take care of the kids and go day to day. No, and I mean and I guess that that's what I um, appreciate about what you're saying too as well. The the individual man or woman, right? We can take, um, uh, we can take action on our own, but there is this overarching system that's the framework for everybody. And like when something's broke and it ties itself back to that, it is really important to be looking at how to change that framework. And this place is so fundamentally unfair right now. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the global 1% now parties in Hawaii. So they have um, done major developments by they, I mean, um, land owning developers have done major um, investments and pushed out communities in urban Honolulu, mm-hmm. um, Kailua Kona, the south side of Kauai, the south side of Maui. Right. All those communities are like deeply changed in just the last decade. Oh, and so yeah. it's like they're almost unrecognizable. And then who are the people that actually work for these kinds of um, off-site corporations? And who are the folks that um, are trying to raise kids and live here in Hawaii? Mm-hmm. And uh, and they they don't live in those places anymore. So I, I think yeah. that it's about um, fundamental fairness that if we're going to have a tourism and military based economy, that mm-hmm. the people that work in that economy need to um, uh, need to have some basic guarantees, like not getting flooded out, uh, like uh, not like not having to uh, <laughs> right. uh, pay for a, a mega jail, um, to know that the criminal justice system that they might find themselves involved with, hopefully not. Um, is fair. Um, these are the fundamental guarantees of a democracy. No. Um, and so with that, I want to turn a little bit. Um, I mean, unless you have any other statements you want to make about the prison, I think, you know, when, as we circle back to, you know, uh, the, our society here, our community here, and the way that we want that to be, um, I just want to talk a little bit about your art. 
because you were saying, you know, a lot of times that that community too can have either a little bit more flexibility or come at um, issues in a in a different way. And so, aside from your legal work and like your art, how how do you utilize that? Oh well, I mean, I'm a I've kind of always been an <laughs> artist. <laughs> I don't know what that makes me, but I mean, uh, yeah. So I I'm a printmaker. I do lithographs and woodcuts and um, etchings and. In a few years ago, I had the opportunity to be um, artist at the museum, like an artist in residence with mm-hmm. the Holy Museum of Art. Um, it's just a part of me, and um, and a lot of times when I'm thinking out the work that I'm doing as a lawyer mm-hmm. or as a writer, um, it's my job to be precise and find the right words. But oftentimes mm. I can't, and so I make something, and um, and sometimes that helps me, um, and it's a sometimes art is therapeutic sometimes it's straight up work but it's just mm. a, but it's just a part of me and um and i i suppose that in my personal life um i identify more with artists like i, mm. I hang out with mm-hmm. artists more um like they they're funnier and more interesting <laughs> to me <laughs> right they're like um you know it's like I, I i don't like to go to like a sports bar with like my like <laughs> like law school classmates it's like I want to like make something or go to an art show or like or like be a part of that kind of a discussion it's 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 a it's a more holistic way of being to me well it's interesting because I do it's um it's funny how many lawyers I know that either don't like don't practice law or kind of got into it and then don't obviously utilize legal knowledge that's very helpful in a lot of disciplines um but don't really practice law or lawyers that like do art on the side but the ones that I've known most often it's it doesn't really at least visually right have a direct connection it's kind of something that they maybe they wanted to be uh, an artist but chose law or it seems to be a way that they kind of decompress from their legal work yeah. and yours though has an interesting crossover um, I mean like not that all of your work is political but I mean for you like what is that percentage where you're literally using your art in political statements or to like really cross over into the legal justice work that you do or is all of it there i, I it's it's not that conscious <laughs> you know like i mean <laughs> like it's i mean so right. it's like so I, i'm just being right so it's like true I, when you're but i mean if you so grant i so that's cool i i definitely didn't picture you in your studio like consciously thinking out but if you look at your body of work you know what i mean that some of it is Political. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I did like um, I, with friends. We built essentially a chapel that discusses mm-hmm. that in, invokes Pacific art. Um, let's see, I uh, Catholic, right? So it's like I made a version of Stations of the Cross um, that had images of the canoe and mm. of prisons and, <laughs> and the beach and all that kinds of stuff. And uh, and it just felt natural. To, to yeah. make the kind of art that reflects the work that I'm doing. Um, so much of the stuff is just not paid. I'm just, you know, I, I pay the rent as a lawyer yeah. or as a writer, but then, uh, you know, I make things too. Mm-hmm. And then, and do you do just the landscape or the ocean or the... Yeah, no, a couple, like, I mean, so a few years ago I made um, prints of like the Alala, the Hawaiian Crow, and then um, a couple like Duke Kanomoku jumping into the pool. Those like pay the rent for a few, <laughs> for a few months. That was kind of cool. That's nice. Um, and I guess those are political too. So it's not as if like I'm trying to intentionally make something aesthetically pleasing is decoupled from my politics. It's like, right. it's, I, I'm trying to write it pretty. I'm trying to <laughs> say it well. Nice. Um, that's, that's, that's my job. Nice. Um, it, uh, you know, I'm not the hammer. I'm a, like I'm, I'm influenced deeply by poetry and by art, and um, no, that's interesting. Yeah. I think in our in our pre conversation, maybe you didn't say you are a pacifist, but you could probably easily be a pacifist. But now that you've gone to law school, like you've been trained to be a litigator, right? you've been trained to be a fighter, so you have this, you have lots of layers. Uh, yeah, and I can't quit. So um, mm-hmm. a lot of the people I know that um, were trained in litigation, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's. It's hard, right? Because you're getting beat up, and then you can the stakes are high. So you know, like you mess up, your client goes to jail. Yeah, it's stressful. Um, or you mess up, and your client loses money, or your license is on the line. Mm-hmm. And that's how it is a lot. And then the work just doesn't stop. So yeah. Um, so if you have what I would say was too many clients, um, <laughs> you know, like then and you 
and you know you're trying to pay the rent or pay a mortgage and it's like it's it, it could be a really brutal profession so it's like I don't um, you know it's like I see why people just straight up quit but that's really not an option for me um, you know I'm I'm in a few kind of heady lawsuits right now and, mm-hmm. uh, and that's just what I do it's it's part of what I do no but well and I it, in the way that you're talking about it though I can see how whether it's conscious or not the I guess the multi-layered nature and the cross-sector nature of your world of art and journalism though clearly sustains you in some way you find that's you definitely find value I mean that am I, is that a wrong assumption that it helps you not quit <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 so it's like so you don't want to yeah, so the idea is not to quit you can rest right, right? Okay. so it's like so you're allowed to take a break and you, you like, can sit and, on your board yeah you can chill or like or if you're doing yoga it's like just stop for a minute or mm-hmm. like or if you're like like you know my dad's a, like plays basketball and my friends are like ballers it's like if that's like you can sit one out but <laughs> You like you know you don't have to pick every damn fight, but like but you're not allowed to quit. I mean, mm. we've only got so much time <laughs> on this planet, right? And um, and I think that uh, you know I've dedicated the last sort of ten years towards making a more equitable justice system and trying to make cool stuff with my friends. I, I, that's how I want to live the rest of my life, really. Sweet. Yeah. So are you ready for like my little like fast rapid round fire questions? Yeah, do whatever. All right. So the best wave that you've ever ridden to date. Oh, um, I don't know the Hawaiian word for it, but you know the way that it's breaking today? It's off of um, Kaimana, yeah. the left. That's, uh, they, so they call it castles, but that's a famous one that um, yes. Japan Moku Road, like, yes. like that left all the way into the Royal Hawaiian that wraps mm-hmm. all the way into Waikiki. So it's like, uh, yeah, I surfed that one when we had that big August swell like in like five or six years ago, and it was just big and scary. And, like, and nice. it just kept going because it connects all the way to Publix. Ah. So that was that was gnarly. Yeah. And um, what is like maybe your dream wave? Is it in Hawaii? Is it some other place? Where where is your dream wave that you'd like to ride one day? Oh, there's so wow, that's so cool. I saw these guys get really like really score in Ireland one time. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like a, 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 oh. Yeah, I, I want to say yeah, it must have been on social or something, and it was like from I remember just because it, it was a place like I didn't connect that place and wave. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, it, yeah. And you know, like, like so, like so they're off, they're off the coast of like a cliff in Ireland, and that looked pretty sweet. And it looked a little cold, but they it looked like they were in like two, three wetsuits, and then you can go to like a cheap pub afterwards and just kick it. So like, like that looks like a fun vacation. But I mean, I, we live in Hawaii, you know. It's like there's right. like you're gonna score every day if you if you really want to, you know. <laughs> and um, and I mean, you know, it's like I'm not the best surfer in the world, but I just jump out there as much as I can. Yeah, uh, best kid time memory. Oh. I don't know. Um, I don't know. A lot of them. My mom is funny. She's still around. My, my sister, um, I have a niece and two nephews. It's cool seeing them be kids. Um, so many. Uh, being, being a kid wasn't totally traumatic. I, I had my deal. <laughs> I, I, like, I definitely deal, dealt with like um, white kid bullies and stuff, but not so much. I mean, I'm, not, not so much that I'm like traumatized as an adult. Clearly, you seem you seem fairly balanced. Yeah, I'm alright. Uh, so, uh, currently, like a, a recent favorite book. I mean, if you have one of all time, but if not, like a current. Favorite oh, book. I'm reading um, "We Are the Ocean" by Apeli Haofa. Ah. He is a Tongan yep. um, writer and poet. He he worked for the Tongan government, but I think he's pretty brilliant. Prior to that, I was reading. Um, a collection of poems by Hone Tuare, uh, uh, and then uh, and then I was rereading um, um, "This Is How You Lose Her" by Juno Diaz. He's, he's actually a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's in Boston. So, nice. Yeah. I, I guess all I just named three men, but I could probably name like three <laughs> women too. But Come on, the, let's go gender yeah, equity. Yeah, gender know, so equity but here. The, 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 that was just what was on deck recently. Cool. Yeah. And my last question, and I ask this of everyone since the podcast is called. Um, and still the waters rise. I always ask people, you know, what is your favorite water, fresh or salt, you know, where and, and why? What is your favorite water? And I've had a myriad of answers. There's no... Oh, that's weird, huh? Everything from... I've, my answers have been from, well, I really like, you know, amniotic fluid and it, like it went a whole other direction to... 
um, really heavy rain in Hilo on a tin roof to... Yeah, that's what some people describe as like the sound of the Pacific because you know, mm. that corrugated tin was all over after yeah. the war, right? So. so for you, what is your... Is it fresh or salt water? And like, where is that favorite water for you? Um... Oh gosh, Waikiki is so commercialized and messed up and um, and now owned by like non-local corporations and stuff, mm -hmm. but there's still nothing nicer than catching a wave outside of bowls or like being in the boat with, in the canoe with with the guys and like trying yeah. to hit it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so and then there's like, there's a whole bunch of waves that kind of connect off of Diamond Head, so it's like you can get... Um, one from like um, Kaikos and Cromwells, and then connect that to like inside, and then and then um, and there's like the other waves that are off of Lighthouse. Mm. Just that whole coast is just lovely. No, it, it's really fun. I agree. Like right at Silvergrove, but my dad would always talk about little kid days there, and so my even though I see the hotels, I think of what he says, and I actually very much enjoy Waikiki. Yeah. So I mean, in the last. Uh, 10 or so years being part of a canoe club it, like I, when I think of Waikiki I don't even think of the street I think of oh that's right no I know don't you guys paddle yeah yeah so we, right yeah, out we're out of Waikiki yeah, yeah, right yeah. so it's like so when I think of uh, when people say Waikiki I think of the ocean and I think of like a series of breaks and a series of reefs mm -hmm. um, and I become quite familiar with them and, and it's, a, it's really a joy yeah nice um, well after such a hard hitting topic I think ending on joy is a good thing. Oh, yeah. Um, that's clearly what uh, you're trying to do, right? Bring some joy. That's definitely with this podcast and the other work that I do in my own way, trying to open those doors to, to joy and have people see that even in the midst of some challenges we have to take over. So, um, I don't know, any last words? I really appreciate you being no, here. No, no, no. Mahalo. Thank you so much for inviting me on here. Um, there's going to be a lot of work to do in the community with regards to making a more equitable justice system. Mm -hmm. um, I am back in court and back in the writing law. This is what I do. And, um, and, um, and yeah, thank you again. Yeah, no. So um, you guys can go ahead and, like I said, once the show is posted, um, it'll be in the first few days of November. 2018. Um, I'll definitely have some links. I'll get those from you, Sunny, in terms of like where people can go and, and look about any kind of information uh, as well as Sunny's uh, page because maybe you're going to run again. Oh, I'm definitely running again. You don't get um, <laughs> the support of the community and and um, I went to funerals and first baby luau's. Um, yeah, I. It, it'd, be, it'd be one thing if I was if, if it was a blowout, but it wasn't a blowout. <laughs> so I'm a, so I'm gonna be running for office again probably in about a year and a half. Until um, then, I've more than got enough work to do. Like you said, he's not a quitter. All right. Yeah. Okay. Good show. Thanks, honey.